I have one verse of scripture that I want to preach on today. I did not choose the scripture, it chose me. In fact, I would say it jumped up and bit me on, on, bit me on my neck and told me, preach me or I'll kill you. It was just that fierce, the way, the way that this verse came to me. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. Um, you know what, though? If we preach on just one verse today, if we preach on 1 Corinthians 15, 10, how's that going to make verse 9 feel? And if we skip by verse 8 to get to verse 9. So I only want to preach one verse, but I think I should start at verse 1 so that we do not offend any of the other verses whose support we need contextually in order to give the full illumination of the meaning of the verse. So uh, listen to these words now from the Apostle Paul. And I don't uh, make you stand the whole time if you're new here. <laughs> you get a little nervous at this point. We do sit down. And then some people stand back up. Just the ones who love Jesus, they jump up while I'm preaching and stuff. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You can love Jesus and sit down too. It's just you love him more if you stand up, but you can love him a little bit and sit through a sermon. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Would you touch your neighbor and tell him, don't waste it? Don't waste it. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But Everybody shout, but. That's one of the biggest words in the Bible, by the way. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big word, three letters, but it's a big word. Everybody shout, but. I was going down. I thought it was over. They laid him in the ground, and hell had a party on Friday night. Ask somebody next to you, say, how big is yours? That's what I want to know. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. I want to speak to you for a few moments today on this subject, the gift in the grind. The gift in the grind. On your way to your seat, touch somebody and say, I'm on my grind. You've seen that hashtag on Instagram, right? On my grind. Hashtag gym flow. Hashtag humbled. Hashtag filter free. Hashtag paleo. Hashtag CrossFit, bro. Hashtag it's every day, bro. Hashtag, hashtag on my grind. No, you're not on your grind. You're on your phone. Put down your phone and just go to the gym. If you go to the gym enough, you won't have to post about it. We'll all notice the results. Unless you want to show off your shoes, then take a selfie. I mention it because Paul is um, he's coming across a little bit humble braggy. In 1 Corinthians, I know, I know, he's the Apostle Paul, and everything he says is supposed to be so wonderful. But I will be honest with you, I like the Bible. Like, I really like the Bible. What a relief. <laughs> it wouldn't matter if I liked it or not, it would be true. But I happen to like the Bible now more than when I first started reading it. It's just that now I don't like everybody in the Bible all the time. Like Jonah. I don't like Jonah. 
because God went through so much trouble to get Jonah to preach a message in Nineveh, and then by the time he preached the message after God had to track him down and dispatch a whale and send a storm and all of this nonsense that Jonah couldn't just go where he was supposed to preach and say what he was supposed to say, when he did preach, it wasn't even that great of a sermon. This was his whole sermon. Forty days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Well, anybody could have done that. And, um, and I don't want to offend you so early in the sermon. I usually save that until about the 22-minute mark. <laughs> right here, Paul, Paul is annoying me a little bit, a little bit, just a little bit. Now, I'm sure he doesn't care that I'm annoyed with this passage that he wrote to the church at Corinth. He's not writing it as a, as a letter to me or to you as his primary audience. He's He's trying to get the church in Corinth to live out what God has invested, put in. That's really the challenge of life is to live out what God has put in. What makes that difficult is the grind. The grind. The glory of God is such a wonderful, mesmerizing, and peace-inducing concept when we're together like this. I wonder if I would be able to preach as well if I had to follow you onto your job and see the people that you deal with. I wonder if my sermons would be, well, you're saying amen a little too loud right now. A little offended, but there is a sense in which every time I stand up to preach, I am aware that the gospel has to be lived out, not in the confines of a cathedral, but in the grind of everyday life. And life is a grind. And marriage is a grind. I know their vows were beautiful, but there's some stuff they didn't put in those vows because they didn't know about them yet. But four years into marriage, if they could say the vows the way they really go, it wouldn't be big, broad concepts like sickness and health and life and death, because there's a lot of stuff in between life and death called grind. It's called, do I really have to remind you to put gas in the car? You're 47 years old, and we've been talking about this for 21 years. Did you really leave the van on empty again? That's why people get divorced. It's not big things. It's 793 dirty socks left in the room after I told you 43 times. I'm not your mom. Pick up after yourself. It's just the grind. And I was confused because I thought people I thought people quit their jobs because big horrible things happened and I thought people gave up on themselves because of catastrophic cataclysmic events. I found out that it's the grind. The the grind makes ministers put down their microphone. I think I think they they put down their microphone not because they quit loving Jesus or left their first love. I think the grind makes volunteers quit showing up to serve. Because it's kind of our fault. When we sign you up to volunteer, we show you the glory. But we hide the grind. You see these beautiful women with the welcome team t-shirts on there? I guarantee you some people on their team didn't show up to serve that were supposed to serve today. Now that happens to you enough Sunday mornings when you put aside your Sunday morning to serve and somebody didn't even have the stuff ready that you needed to serve. After a while, you rip your name tag off and you say, well, I love Jesus, but this sucks and I can serve God in my own way. I think I'll serve him on the boat. I have a boat ministry. Jesus did stuff on the boat. I'm going to go on the boat too, Lake Norman. They had 70 volunteers sign up for Lake Norman to volunteer at Lake Norman this weekend. I'm just going to be upfront with you and tell you what they may not have told you at the campus. It's a grind. It's a grind. I mean, it's a good grind, and God's going to do great things, but it's a grind. How uninspiring could the introduction to my sermon possibly be? But to tell you that after you've picked out the baby names, and after they threw you a gender reveal party, and a gender reveal reveal party, and a gender reveal 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 party, here comes the grind. The grind of diapers. <laughs> the grind of long nights. The grind of red eyes and red bull. And but the good news is, if you make it through the infancy stage, the grind stops. After that, raising children is easy. No more grind. 
you're sitting next to your child, tell them, you're a grind. I love you. I'm grateful for you. See, that's the thing. I'm not ungrateful for what God has given me. That's not why I get a bad attitude. That's not why I sometimes don't want to show up. I appreciate I know there are people who would love to have my life, and it makes me feel bad and guilty when you compare my life to somebody else, and I think, well, it could be worse. And people will say things like, well, you know, you could be in the hospital room if you know somebody in the hospital room would love to go to your job Monday. But they're not going, and I am, and I'm in the grind, and I am grateful I have a job. But there's just sometimes that the grind. Well, Paul is talking to a church that would have been very familiar with the grind. It's not some little town. Corinth is a, a major city, not exactly a port city, but connected to one. That meant they had all the infrastructure of an urban city. That meant that the transportation systems were complicated, so they knew what it was to have a traffic jam, just the grind. Just the grind of trying to figure out how to worship Christ in a culture that is counter Christ. Just the grind. Trying to figure out how to serve Christ in a culture that is counter Christ when what is culturally normative is counter Christian. It's a grind. It's just a grind. And Paul reminds them of the importance of the gospel. He said, I want to remind you not of the information that the gospel contains, but the importance of it, because the grind can make you forget what's really important. You know this. The grind can make you lose a sense of priority so that you start giving your best energy to your lowest priorities. It's just the grind. Paul writes to them that he understands it. He does it in a strange way, though, and this is where he started to get on my nerves a little bit, because when he said, I want to remind you of the gospel and the resurrection, which is your hope, I was with him. When he said, if you don't hold on to it and you don't really believe in it, it's like it never happened, I understand what he's saying, not that God is going to take his grace away, but that sometimes if I don't walk in it, what good is it? I understand why he's saying this gospel did not originate with me. It just came through me, because a lot of people probably worshiped Paul and saw him as some indispensable gift to the body of Christ, but he realized that really all he was doing was re-gifting what God had given to him. I understand his sequence, how he said that he was the last one in to this OG apostle group, how he said that Almost everybody seemed to be picked before him, and then in a blinding light on the road to Damascus as he was on his way to persecute Christians, the very Christ who he was persecuting by coming against those who stood for his name knocked him off of his horse. Oh yes, God will clothesline you if you are headed in the wrong direction, because he loves you too much to let you waste your whole life headed for a destination that will ultimately disappoint you. Can I preach a little bit? So I get it when Paul says that I don't have anything that I didn't receive, and I'm with him when he says that it's all gospel all the time. When he gets to this part, though, verse 9, we should look at it again. For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not buying it, partially because his very name is almost synonymous with apostle. If I said the apostle and then let you fill in the blank, you know, who wrote 13 of the 27 New Testament books? The apostle? See, you didn't say Bartholomew. And he was one too. But you didn't name your kid that? The apostle? Paul. And so for him to be saying, "Oh, oh, oh, and this is not his rookie year." I get it. In your first year, you've been killing Christians, or at least consenting to their murder. They laid the garments at your feet when Stephen was stoned, when Jesus Christ gave a standing ovation to Stephen because of his boldness, and you stood there watching it, and not only watching it, but endorsing it and supporting it. I understand how, at that point, it could take you a little while, but you've been in the game 30 years, planting churches all throughout the Roman Empire, taking it where Peter didn't dare to take it. In fact, 
Peter had a sort of prejudice that didn't show itself except when he was around people who he thought were as prejudiced as he was. Paul wasn't that way. Paul didn't talk one way in front of one group or one race and then talk another way when he got around his friends or his boys. He was just determined to take the gospel to all people. I just said something right there. One person all the time, but Paul said, you know, really, I don't feel worthy of this. I've been in it so long, and I know I'm a legend, but I don't even really feel like what you think I am. I don't even really feel like I deserve this title, and I'm doing the job, and I'm filling the position, but can I be honest with you? Sometimes I feel more like a little boy than I do like a dad. It's the difference between the title others give me and the truth I tell myself. And Paul knew a truth about himself that caused him to always feel a little unworthy of his title. He said, I'm the least of the apostles, and I don't deserve to be called an apostle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like the singers who just sing so good, and then you're like, oh, you know, you, that was so good. And they go, oh, you know, try. shut up. You know, you can sing. And then there's some other ones who think they can sing and need a friend. <laughs> I, I remember the first compliment I was ever given as a preacher, and there was a lesson in it because I preached this little sermon about the, uh, the time that Peter was walking on the water and he saw the wind and the waves and he began to sink. I was 16 years old, preaching at Monks Corner United Methodist Church, because at age 16, you know all about the wind and waves of life. It qualifies you to bring a word to the people. And I got done preaching my sermon, and uh, when you first start preaching, people are very kind. They see it as their responsibility to help bridge the gap between your intention and your performance. <laughs> So they say sweet things, especially in the South. They might not mean them, but Southerners will say it anyway. And uh, George Altman came up to me after my first sermon and said, uh, you did a good job today. George Altman was a legend at the church. He'd been in the church longer than the church had been in the church. He said, uh, you did a good job today. And when he said it, I felt like that I shouldn't just say thank you, because that felt kind of arrogant that I should say something spiritual back. So Mr. George said, that was a good job today. I said, thank you, but it wasn't me. It was all God. And George Altman said, it wasn't that good. <laughs> you know, there's a little bit of you in it if it would have been all God. <laughs> Touch somebody say, you're not that good. And I feel Paul, not only does it feel a little bit like a humble brag, I don't even deserve to be an apostle. It's all God. And he knows he's smart, and he knows he's of the tribe of Benjamin, and he knows he's a Pharisee of Pharisees, and he knows that he studied under Gamaliel, who was the, the, the Jedi spiritual teacher of Judaic tradition, and he knows all of this. But he said, you know, I really don't even feel like an apostle. But then he confused me because in verse 10, he can't make up his mind. Watch this. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, than Cephas, than the 12, than the 500. I outworked everybody that God picked before me, yet not I. But it was the grace of God that was with me. So which one was it, Paul? I worked harder than all of them. I took the gospel where none of them would dare to go. Shipwrecks and lashings and accusations. I was on my grind. But it wasn't me. It was all God. Which one was it? Was it your grind, or was it God's grace? I don't believe in talking to dead people, but I swear I feel like Paul answered me this week. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit. And said, why do you always try to keep two things apart that in the mind of God go together? And I realized that I was doing with the text what often happens 
even in our own nation, is that two things that are really meant to go together get so divided, and now we see as opposites two things that actually cannot operate unless they operate in tandem. So one person will say, I want justice, and another person will say, but I'm a patriot. But those two are not opposites because you can't be a patriot if there is not justice. It's got to work together. Do you hear me? What God has joined together, let not man separate. That's not just a marriage scripture. We do it all the time. So you got some people who want to read the Bible on their couch and say, I'm all about grace. You, know, you really probably shouldn't sleep with your girlfriend. You should make a commitment to her in marriage, and you should probably see what the Bible says about sexuality. No, I am what I am. Got the spirit of Popeye comes over you when somebody starts saying something. I am what I am. I want what I want. God knows what I want. He didn't want me to want it. He should have made me different. Well, he should have made, made me want like all these women. And, uh, you, should, you know, it's his fault. He made them look good. <laughs> I like your awkward laughter where you feel like we got out of church and got into real. Real life. The grind. The grind. The grind. The grind. I had the grace of God, you know. I don't go to church, but you know, God, me and God, we got our thing. We chill over the game. <laughs> See, fantasy football is how I connect with God. That's my connection with God because I feel like He's my quarterback. And God speaks to me over the game. It's, it's a grace thing. You wouldn't understand. Those of you who like commit yourself to church and discipline, you, you, you just don't get the grace of God. Paul said, no, 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 no. You don't get the grind. Paul said, I got grace and I got grind. Those two are not opposites. I've got grace and I've got truth. Those two are not opposites. I've got grace, but it's not this fake grace, this cheap grace, this phony grace that finds you and just covers you. This is a grace that changes you. Paul said, when you've been where I've been, and you've done what I've done, and God picks you up off of a dirty Damascus road and gives you a mission and forgives your sins and cleanses you from your unrighteousness and sets your feet on a rock. When you get this kind of grace, you don't stay on the couch. You walk into your calling determined and committed to be what he called you to be. I am what I am because of his grace, and I will not stay what I was. I'm becoming what I I shall be by the grace of God. Give him a shout of praise if you got grace. Come on, all the way to the top. Praise him for his grace. Grace will make you praise him. Grace will make you persevere. Grace will make you get up and go again. Grace will make you change your ways. Grace will make you say, I'm sorry. Grace will make you stick it out. Did anybody make it by the grace of God? So Paul said, there's two ways to look at this. I'm on my grind. I'm on my grind. I'm serving God more than all of them. And the reason I serve God more than all of them is because I needed more grace than any of them. This is the part of the sermon where the people who aren't perfect should shout, because when you know that you don't deserve what God has given you. Nobody has to make you serve God. You know every breath is a gift. Every step is grace. Every day is grace. His mercies are new with every rising of the sun. I want all the unworthy people to shout, all the undeserving people to shout. Come on, Rock Hill. Come on, Gaston. Come on, Lake Norman. Come on, UC. Come on, Blakeney. You might want to jump up on your feet for 17 seconds and thank him for his unmerited thing. I got great. Oh, 
Oh yeah. And I'm not grinding to get God's favor. I'm grinding because I've already got God's favor. I got grace in the grind. So I want to make a new hashtag. I want to make a new hashtag. I want you to post this week, hashtag, on my grind, but change it a little bit. Sit down, I'll show you. It says, I worked harder than them all. I outworked them all because I outsend them all. I outworked them all because of what I knew about me. Not so God would love me, but because he did so much. I didn't bust through the front door and anoint his feet with perfume to earn his acceptance. It was because he had already given me his acceptance. It meant so much to me. So I'm, I'm on my grind, but it's not really me. It's his grace to me. And perhaps here a distinction would be helpful between the common grace of God that is given to all men, the saving grace of God, which brings us into right relationship with him, and then that particular grace of God that God has given you and no one else. Elijah, God gave me a grace to raise you. Any other dad in this room would fail at it, but I can do this because I got grace for it. Not that I need it. I got grace for it. God doesn't just give you a grace to save you. He gives you a special grace for your grind. God does not just give grace to a preacher when he stands in a pulpit. He gives grace for negotiation in a boardroom. If that's your place, that's your grace. God has given you a particular grace. It is custom designed to fit in the space where God has assigned you. Paul said it was his grace to me. His grace to me. Verse 3, I passed on to you that which was given to me. The grace that God gave me, I re-gifted it to you. That's all I did. I get weary when I try to pass on to others what God did not give to me. But when I stay on my grind, hashtag in my grace, that's the new hashtag. I'm on my grind. Touch somebody say, I'm on my grind, but I'm in my grace. Hashtag in my grace. That, that's how. Give me that bag. Follow me around. You follow me with that bag? I want you to go into situations this week. Can I use you? You don't look so sure. <laughs> it's those situations in your life that require extra grace. Those people in your life, one author called it EGR people, extra grace required people. Do not make eye contact with the person you came to church with right now. That would be the worst thing you could do. And I want you to take the situation in your life this week that the, the grind. And in your mind, I want you to see it as a gift. So I got a whole bag of bows. And I want you to take the situation this week. That you've been asking God to take away, and He won't. And when that person comes your way that tries your soul to the marrow of its essence, oh God, how many of you just had a flash image of who they are? Put a bow on them. In your mind now, don't do it, don't do it really. You know, that, that might. But that person. That you got to deal with 
and you can't make them go away. But I want to find, here it is, the gift in the grind. Oh, thank you, annoying person. Thank you, long drive to work. I've been needing to listen to my audio Bible that is on my iPhone app, and you just gave me 37 extra minutes to do it. What a gift. It's the gift in the grind. Oh, thank you, <laughs> dentist office. <laughs> just a little stuff, you know, just a little stuff for giving me the opportunity to meditate. And even though this dental hygienist is trying to talk to me while she has an instrument of death in my mouth, why do they do that? I'm going to take this as a gift. You look better with that. It's a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. Everybody shout, it's a gift. It's a gift. It didn't look like a gift at first, but you know that person that doesn't like you? That God is using to set you free from the need to have people like you? It's a gift. It's a gift. Shout it out loud by faith. It's a gift. Doesn't have to feel good to be good. All things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. So I'm looking for the gift in the grind. I'm looking for the gift in the discouragement. Imagine how much fun it's going to be to go through the boring parts of your week with a bag full of bows, just looking for the grace of God. Just looking for the mercy of God. Just looking for the gift of God. Because if I seek, I will find. And if I knock, the door will be open. And if I embrace the grind, I can receive the gift. Because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. To somebody say, I got a gift. It's a gift. It's a gift. That's how I do it. I'm out of bows. You take the bag. I got a gift. High five everybody in your vicinity and say, what a gift. What a gift. My weakness is a gift. My struggle is a gift. God could have knocked Paul off of his horse before he ever consented to the killing of a Christian, but if he had done it too early, Paul would have valued it too little. I have a feeling that when God really wants to use somebody in a great way, just like they took the olives to make the oil that went in the lamps, that went in the tabernacle, so that they could burn in the presence of the Lord, had to be hand-pressed so that there would be no pulp in the lamp that would cause the light not to burn as brightly or as long. I have a feeling that God does to the life that he really wants to hand-pick what they would do to those olives, and he hand-presses the life to get the oil to flow from the purest place. That's what the grind is for, to get out my pride. That's what the grind is for, to get out my self-reliance. That's what the grind is for, to get out my superiority. If God would have given it to me too early, I would have thought I was better, but now I can say, I don't even deserve to be what you're calling me. But I'm it. But it's not me. But it's in me. And I'm on my grind when I'm in my grace. Here's the challenge the enemy can't stop God from giving you grace. So he wants to stop you from using it. Wow. 
and I want to ask a question of everyone who made the choice to come to church today. Have you been wasting your grace? Paul said, God gave me so much grace. And when Eugene Peterson tried to translate his version of 1 Corinthians 15.10 in the Message Bible, he had to say it like this, God has been so very good to me, and I don't intend to waste a drop of it. I won't waste it because it costs too much. Waste is relative to value. When you've had so much of something for so long, you, you lose the value of it. and So you use it, and you abuse it. Because you have lost your sense. I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, the gospel that God gave to me and I gave to you. And now you're in this gospel and you're in this grace, but you're wasting it. The church at Corinth had a lot of problems, not only idolatry, not only sexism, not only divisions in the church, not only sexual problems, but they, they had gift envy. It was a church full of gifted people that were walking around with other people's gift on their wish list. And when you envy someone else's gift, you waste your grace. When you wish that you had what they had, you miss the gift that God has given you. Don't waste your grace because you're wishing for someone else's. Well, if I could be like her, I guess I would. I, I, Paul said, I am what I am, and guess what? That means I'm not what I'm not. But it's okay, because I got my own grace. I got my own grace. I don't need yours. I got my own. How many times have we wasted the grace that God has given us because we have envied the gifts that he gave another? I see people miss the season that they're in because they're waiting on the one that's to come. You will waste the grace of this season if your focus is on the next one. And now you're weary. And now you're burdened. Now you want to give up because you've wait not not that you don't have the grace. You're wasting it. It's right there. Be sad to get to heaven, and there's a big pile of all the grace that God gave you each day that you didn't appropriate because you were waiting until you felt worthy. Paul said, I know, I know what I did, but if I stay in my shame, I will waste my grace. And the price that was paid for me to stand in this grace was too great for me to waste it. I will not waste my grace. The past is behind me. The cross is before me. And I will not waste the grace of this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I refuse to leave any grace misappropriated. So I'm done wishing that I was someone else, because I am what I am by the grace of God. I'm done wishing that I was in a season or a situation that, you know what? I am done wasting the grace that God has given me, worrying about situations that I can't control. That's it. I'm, I'm done. I have wasted enough time crying over stuff that was over and missing stuff that I was living in. I will not waste the grace of this day. Spirit of God, help me minister this message to someone. You have been wasting your grace. The great grace of God, greater, greater than all of our sin, greater than all of our sin, 
great grace. Somebody shout great grace. Great grace. But when you don't value it, you don't get it. And you know that grind that we talked about earlier? The, the stuff that you wish would stop in your life? I didn't want to close the sermon this way, but God told me to because um, he said that it didn't matter how I wanted to close the sermon. It mattered what was true. That grind is what produces the grace. That's where the grace comes, right into that place, right into that insecurity, right into that revolving situation. Stand up so I can pray for you. You've been wasting your grace. Paul said, I didn't ever feel worthy, but I was made worthy, and I will not waste the grace of God waiting for a feeling to accompany the truth. I won't waste it. Why don't you just lift your hands to heaven if you want to receive a fresh empowering of the grace of God? Because I know you need it, man. I know the grind is real. I know sometimes it just grinds the joy right out of you. Father, in your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. It never runs out. We thank you today for common grace that's given to all men, your loving kindness that bends your disposition in favor of the human race that you created. We thank you today for saving grace that took away the penalty of our sin, the effects of our shame, and set us free to know you. I also thank you today for that special grace, that special grace for special struggles, that grace that comes in hospital rooms, that grace that comes in layoffs, that grace that comes in financial crisis, that grace that comes in the kind of success that seems unsustainable. I thank you for this grace, this gift. In Jesus' name. Look at me for a moment. Sometimes you're waiting for God to give you something that he already gave you, and you don't know you have it. One time we were about to write a song, and I was opening us up in prayer. It seemed the pastoral thing to do, and my prayer to me sounded very spiritual. I prayed out loud, God, we're here before you today, and we ask that you would give us a song. I prayed that out loud. I felt God speak back to me, not out loud, but inside. I said, God, give us a song. I felt God say, you give me one. Because I have given you your mouth, your mind, your ears, your spirit, your vocabulary, my word, your experiences. I have given you the grace. Now give me a song. I believe God wants you to give him a song today. I believe if you would open your mouth right now in this moment, the grace of God would invade situations. The grace of God would invade shame. Thanks for joining us today. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, we would love for you to help us reach people through investing. To give, go to elevationchurch.org slash give or download our app and select give. And don't forget, subscribe to our channel so you can hear more teachings like this one.